One night, while a broke Metallica were loitering outside the famous Troubadour nightclub in West Hollywood, hatching plans to weasel their way into the show, the proverbial toast of the town, local glam metal heroes, Motley Crue, emerged from the venue and strolled by the hapless Metallica. Motley Crue's self-produced Too Fast For Love album had already sold 20,000 units. And as the four giants, propped up by high heels and Aquanet hairspray, walked by the degenerates in Metallica, they were interrupted by a shout of, You guys suck! Hetfield remembers it well. They just turned around and flicked a cigarette at the band. Metallica weren't even worthy of contempt at that stage. Metallica's first concert was on March 14, 1982, at Radio City in Anaheim. The band had rehearsed just two original songs and seven covers from new wave of British heavy metal acts. Like the time Ulrich and Hetfield first met, there was no chemistry, no chills, just a terrible performance to kick off what would end up, paradoxically, being an illustrious career on the road. Hetfield was nervous about singing without a guitar, now that Mustaine had assumed six-string duties. And just like that, Mustaine broke a string. (coughs) To James, it seemed like it took Mustaine forever to change the string, leaving him just standing there awkwardly. The crowd didn't dig it at all. Despite their loathing for LA's glam metal scene, Metallica have Motley Crue to thank for getting them a gig supporting Saxon, one of the big new wave of British heavy metal acts of the day. Ron was taking photos for Motley Crue at the time and bumped into Tommy Lee and Vince Neil on the Sunset Strip. Hey, what's up, Ron? Oh, I'm trying to get my band book to support Saxon. Oh yeah, we were going to support them, but... We're getting too big to support, you know? Hey, come on in. We'll introduce you to the chick that does the booking. Ron played her some of Metallica's music. Hey, you guys sound cool. You remind me of Black and Blue. While the band didn't actually have a great deal in common with Black and Blue, they did end up scoring the support slot, at least for one of the two nights that Saxon would be performing at the Whiskey A Go-Go. Rat would be supporting them the other night. On stage, Lars Ulrich asked if he could use the stage fan, but it was made clear that the fan was just for Saxon's drummer, with nothing but two words. Fuck you. But that wasn't going to stand in the way of the driven Dane, who was not short on self-belief, justified or otherwise. Ventilation or no ventilation, the crowd met Metallica's performance that night with roars of approval. On the back of this, Metallica recorded a four-track demo tape. Momentum began to build. They booked a string of shows, including their own headliner show at the Troubadour nightclub. The show went well. They played nine songs. So well, in fact, that they were urged back on stage for an encore. But there was only one problem. The band hadn't actually rehearsed or prepared for an encore. So a discussion ensued backstage. What should they play? James suggested that they play Blitzkrieg from the British band of the same name, while Lars cast a vote for Diamond Heads Helpless. They agreed to play Blitzkrieg, but as they assumed their positions on the stage, Lars counted in and started playing the opening bars to Helpless instead. Ill-prepared, James Hetfield stumbled through the song and the words and afterwards threw his guitar at Lars and punched him dead in the stomach. (coughs) Don't ever do that to me again. The band were invited to record a much more polished six-track EP by a fellow by the name of Kenny Kane. The EP would go on to be called No Life Till Leather. Upon presenting the recordings to Kane, he asked, What's this? Where are those punky songs you played live? Uh, they were covers. 
informed Hetfield. Dejected, Kenny Kane told the band that they could keep the master tapes and do whatever the hell they wanted with them. And do whatever the hell they wanted, they did, making hundreds of audio cassette copies, shipping them off to gig promoters, magazines, fanzine writers, tape traders, record stores, you name it. Word quickly started to spread. In fact, one record store owner played the tape for an unsuspecting Brian Slagle. Who's this? This is Metallica. This is Metallica? He couldn't believe how far the band had come in such a short amount of time. As their star started to ascend and shine a little brighter, tensions between band members intensified as well. Dave Mustaine was still dealing drugs at this point in order to get by, and whenever he was out of town, or just out, his place would be robbed. So he invested in some insurance. A pit bull, that is. He brought his pit bull to practice one day, and it was jumping all over Ron's car. Hetfield, concerned the dog would scratch the exterior, moved it with his foot, which set off Mustaine. Mustaine moved in and punched Hetfield square in the face. Ron McGovney then jumped in to protect his high school buddy and was promptly flipped by Mustaine, who had three black belts. With blood flowing and egos bruised, James Hetfield roared, You're out of the band. Get the fuck out of here. Fuck you, I quit, replied a despondent Mustaine. The breakup lasted all of 24 hours. There were more important things to tend to, like their trip to San Francisco, where they would be performing at a gig hosted by Brian Slagle, showcasing LA metal to Northern California. San Francisco, the city by the bay, had developed a rabid heavy metal community and a go-hard-or-go-home code, which suited the heavier and faster side of the heavy metal spectrum. It was home to the mush pit, where circle pits, stage diving, and crowd surfing had become par for the course. 300 crazy amped up teens turned up to Stone Nightclub on Broadway to see Metallica perform that night. We couldn't give away 300 tickets in LA, recalls Lars today. Xavier Russell, a writer for the popular heavy metal magazine Kerrang, was in the crowd that night. He called his bosses back home in the UK in the early hours of the morning. This is going to be the biggest band in the world. Upon their victorious homecoming, the band were invited to the show's opposite number, a showcase of San Francisco bands in LA at the world-famous Whiskey A Go-Go. Metallica turned up to support their friend Brian and say hi, more than anything, but they got more than they bargained for. That night, a metal act by the name of Trauma were performing, and they just so happened to have a virtuoso in their ranks but not one you'd expect. This virtuoso was not a guitarist, nor a drummer, nor a singer. This virtuoso was in fact a bass player. And upon hearing his bass solo, Lars turned to James. Dude, we gotta get this guy in Metallica. Cliff Burden was born on February 10, 1962. Growing up, Burden was an astute loner, content to read his books and listen to music, then play with other kids. He once told his mom, they're not playing, they're just sitting around talking, and that's boring. But it would be the loss of his 16-year-old brother Scott to a brain aneurysm that really stoked the flames and got Burden to focus hard on his music, having already dabbled with the piano and bass guitar. But Burden was different. He didn't just listen to punk or just metal. He also listened to Beethoven, Rush, and Baroque music. He worked so hard that he outgrew the tutelage of his music teacher when he was just a teenager. Lars Ulrich was so excited about the prospects of Burden joining the band that he struggled to conceal his enthusiasm for Cliff. Often waxing enthusiastic about the bass player in earshot of Ron McGovney. Meanwhile, 
Dave Mustaine had taken the liberty of pouring an entire beer into the pickups on Ron's base. When Ron picked it up and plugged it in the next day, it nearly shocked him right across the room. Then Ron's girlfriend told him that she overheard the band talking about bringing Cliff in. This was the last straw. It was all too much for Ron McGovney. He decided to quit the band in December of 1982. This created an opening for Cliff Burden to come in. But it wasn't so simple. Burden asked the band if they wanted him, they need to come to him, to move to Northern California. Given their growing dissatisfaction with the LA metal scene and what they had witnessed up north at their shows in San Francisco, it was not a difficult decision to make, especially if it meant that Cliff Burden would join their ranks. Soon thereafter, the group moved into what they affectionately remember as the Metallica Mansion. Mustaine chose to live alone. Feeling right at home, the band demolished a string of shows at San Francisco's venues, including the iconic Waldorf, before being invited to venture to the East Coast by promoter Johnny Zazula for two shows in New York City. The band's finances were tight, so they opted to travel and sleep in a U-Haul trailer. And as Metallica tells it today, a drunk Mustaine was in charge of the trailer the moment it almost hit an oncoming vehicle. Swerving to safety, but not without rattling its inhabitants around the cabin like crash test dummies, the band's patience for Dave Mustaine was wearing thin. The mood had changed. There was less laughter, more hostility. For the rest of the trip, I felt like an outcast. The band would go on to take up temporary residence in a less than accommodating part of Queens before linking up with local New York City metalers and eventual fellow Big Four of thrash metal act, Anthrax, who did their best to make the band feel welcome, even bringing them a toaster oven so that they could at least cook for themselves. The band played two relatively successful shows in New York, but tensions reached boiling point when Mustaine's continued drunkenness and aggressive behavior, not only towards his bandmates, but also members of other bands, forced them to wake Mustaine up from his slumber on the morning of April 11, 1983. Wake up. What? What is it? Uh, there's no easy way to say this. You're out of the band. What? No second chance? No warning? Uh, no. This hit Mustaine like a pile of bricks. For the previous two years, he'd been an integral and formative member of Metallica. And now, perhaps the only thing he truly cherished was being taken away from him. With too much pride, rather than contest the decision, Dave Mustaine asked, When does my plane leave? There's no plane. You're taking the bus. The move, in retrospect, was kind of hypocritical given the band members' own struggles with the bottle, not to mention the fact that Metallica had often referred to themselves as Alcoholica. James Hetfield took Mustaine down to the bus depot, and as the pair hugged, tears could be seen forming in Hetfield's eyes. Take care, Dave. Mustaine fired back. Don't use any of my music. And with that, Mustaine began a sorrowful and reflective four-day-long journey across the continent, back to San Francisco. A journey that would fuel his growing anger and resentment towards his former band. Sitting at the back of the bus and feeling dejected, Mustaine notices a pamphlet on the floor and picks it up. It's from Californian Senator Alan Cranston, and it warns of the dangers of nuclear proliferation. One line in particular stands out to Mustaine. The arsenal of Megadeth can't be rid, no matter what the peace treaties come to. It's from Californian Senator Alan Cranston, and it warns of the dangers of nuclear proliferation. One line in particular stands out to Mustaine. 
the arsenal of Megadeth can't be rid, no matter what the peace treaties come to. With that, Mustaine borrowed a pencil, and on a discarded cupcake wrapper, he wrote the very first lyrics of his post-Metallica life, for a song he called Megadeth. In the next episode, Metallica gets ready to ride the lightning, while Dave Mustaine sets out in search of a band. If you enjoyed this episode, take a minute to like, share, or subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. This episode was written, narrated, and produced by yours truly, so please forgive me for my sometimes questionable American accents. For full show notes, as well as sources, including some awesome books on both Metallica and Megadeth, visit nofilter.media forward slash battle. Until next time, cue those house lights. This has been a No Filter Media production. Say what you want.